Okay, let's make a start. Um, I'm Robert Wade. I'm a professor of global political economy in the Department of International Development here at LSE. Um, just before the substance, let me go to some housekeeping straight away. Um, first of all, uh, for Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for this event is hashtag LSE World of Insecurity. Second point. Um, please turn off your phones um, so as not to disrupt the event. Um, the event is being recorded, hopefully will be made available as a podcast. Um, as usual, after the lecture, uh, there will be a chance for you to put questions, make comments to the panel, um, and then after that, there will be um, a book signing taking place sounds very old-fashioned, a book signing, but it will be taking place outside, um, and uh, copies of the book will be on sale. Um, so let me now introduce our speaker, Pranab Bardem, um, who uh, is the author of this great book, this one. Um, uh, he is Distinguished Professor Emeritus um, of Economics at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, educated at Presidency College, Calcutta, um, where he uh, followed some years later another distinguished economist named Amartya Sen, as I remember. Um, and then uh, Pranab went to Cambridge. Um, he's been on the faculty of MIT, the Indian Institute, the Delhi School of Economics, before joining Berkeley. Um, he was the BP Centennial Professor here at LSE 2010-2011. Um, for almost 20 years, he was the chief editor of the Journal of Development Economics, and he is the author of, and I can't quite believe this figure, but there it is, 16 books, um, and the editor of 14 other books and the author of more than 150 journal articles. So um, the book is called A World of Insecurity. Um, and one of the main analytical points of the book, um, and I'm telling you this so that you can just keep an eye on how he maneuvers through this issue. One of the main analytical points the distinction between income inequality and income insecurity, and then from income in in insecurity to cultural or status insecurity. And the point being that he argues that there are somewhat different uh, consequences, especially political consequences, that follow from inequality on the one hand and insecurity on the other. So it's interesting to see how um, that <coughs> analytical distinction is um, elucidated. So Pranab is going to speak for roughly 35 minutes and then uh, comments, suggestions, um, and so on from, uh, from uh, Martin Wolf and Tim Besley. I'm going to introduce them be just before they speak. So Pranab. Thank you, uh, Robert, for those uh, generous comments. Um, thank the organizer of this event, uh, and uh, thank you all for coming to listen to me and listen to the two distinguished gentlemen who also, my thanks are to them for agreeing to, to, be, a, to be discussants. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have any slides, and in, in some sense, uh, unlike in my technical seminars, in some sense this is uh, in line with the nature of the book. The book, uh, you'd be surprised to know, it certainly doesn't happen from an economist, has no charts, no equations, and not even a single footnote. Uh, it's meant for a gen very general readership. And um, what I'll do, I'll start first uh, 
there are now dozens of books on uh, erosion of democracy in certainly some major countries in the world. Um, dozens of books. So I have to start by product differentiation. In what way, why another book you should read on democracy. It's called A World of Insecurity, Democratic Disenchantment in Rich and Poor Countries. So four points of product differentiation very quickly. First, uh, most of the books that I have seen are, uh, are on rich countries, uh, mostly on North America and or Europe, Western Europe. Mine covers uh, quite a few developing countries, uh, particularly my focus is on three developing countries, of course, uh, India under Narendra Modi, but other two developing countries I spent some time on, uh, Turkey under Erdogan and uh, Brazil under Bolsonaro. Um, so that's the first uh, product point of product differentiation. Second, which just uh, now Robert alluded to, certainly many economists, but not just economists, have related this democratic disenchantment to the rising inequality at, in the same period. Uh, rising economic inequality. And I personally very much worried about the rising inequality to the extent it's rising, but even when it's not rising, uh, it, the level is very high. Sometimes it's grotesquely high. But I personally believe that the working class anger when they're turning to these demagogues, the working class resentment and anger, not quite due to inequality per se. Uh, it's much more due to the insecurity in their own lives. Quite often, many workers don't have a clear idea how do the top 1% live or, or accumulate their wealth. They, they don't have a clue. But more importantly, in recent years, they have rallied under the banner of some billionaires. Trump is a billionaire. Uh, in this country, Nigel Farage of the original proposer of Brexit is not a billionaire, but I'm, I'm told he's hundreds of millions. He, he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Erdogan is a billionaire. Marine Le Pen in France is a billionaire. Viktor Orban in Hungary is a billionaire. Putin is a billionaire. In this list, Modi is not wealthy, but he's cozy with billionaires. Let me put it that way. So why, if inequality is what exercising you, why are they rallying under the ban banner of these people? And not merely that, these billionaires and rich people, uh, plutocrats, when they get elected, one of the first things they do is um, reduce the taxes of the rich. That's not probably what the working class was demanding most vocally. And uh, relax the business restrictions on, the, on, on, on companies. So I come to insecurity uh, that way, but there, and, and here I differ from many um, of my economist colleagues, and I think economic insecurity is very important in terms of job losses, income losses, etc. but I'm going to show that the economic insecurity is intertwined with cultural insecurity, which is what Robert was alluding to. And in some cases, cultural insecurity uh, is very important. And in fact, the right wing has, has much more control over the cultural narrative. And I think we who are not right wing, at least I'm not, I don't know about you, but uh, is, we have to pay attention to the cultural narrative and, and its impact. So that's my second point of differentiation. I'm going to talk quite a bit about cultural insecurity in the rest of my talk, but let me go to the third point of differentiation, is that I have a long chapter on China. And essentially the question is, is authoritarian capitalism an, an alternative model? And I examine this with great deal of respect 
for the strong points of Chinese governance. So that chapter is essentially on governance, governance issues. And there are quite a few strong points of Chinese governance. But my position is that for those strong points of governance in China, authoritarianism is neither necessary nor sufficient. On the other hand, some of the ugly features of Chinese governance are entirely due, almost entirely due to authoritarianism. So that's, a, so that, so I do discuss China and uh, take Chinese alternative very seriously because it's, uh, in fact, the title of that chapter is The Temptation of Authoritarianism. The fourth product uh, differentiation point is that then all that I've talked about so far is on the first half of the book. The second half is on about what to do. So the second half is on policies. And uh, essentially, and they, that my political prejudices show, essentially it's a plea for rejuvenation of social democracy. I think the social democrats have become discredited in some countries, and, uh, and sometimes rightly so, because uh, as I'm going to also mention later, is that they quite often became complicit in austerity, po austerity policies, and they are sometimes wedded to high finance and so on. Particularly, I'm thinking of Blair, Clinton, social democrat, democrat types. And in what way can we restore the prestige of social democracy, or at least the status of social democracy, without hurting the dynamism that follows from capitalism. In fact, one of the chapter <coughs> titles in one of the uh, in in one of the chapter titles is the fraught relationship between social democracy and capitalism, because capitalism provides dynamic innovations. So. I want to make have capital, capitalism that's more labor friendly without hurting innovations too much. That's not easy to do, but that's what I certainly have in mind. So those are the four points. Very short of, short, shortness of time, what I'll do, I'll just address myself to two questions. In the first part, on the diagnosis part, I'll just address myself to one question, and that is inequality, insecurity, these are left-wing issues. Why are the workers turning right rather than left? With some small exceptions in Latin America, in most of the cases of uh, erosion of democracy, it's right-wing extremism, and, and that's where uh, the workers seem to be turning. So I'm trying to understand that, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So let me quickly mention a few points there in answering that question. One, in some cases, the right, quite cleverly, is co-opting some left issues. And let me explain what I mean. It's very interesting to me that not just in developing countries, uh, uh, what I'm going to say is certainly true of Erdogan and Modi, but also in Europe. The right, the new, this right, the extreme right, has not given up on the welfare state. So if you look at what the Polish uh, party, what is it named, uh, PIS, the right-wing extreme Polish party, but they, they are quite, uh, supportive of the welfare state. The major exception in this cooptation is the United States. So for example, the right wing, the Republican Party, is very hostile to child assistance policies in the United States. And if you look at Poland, the Polish are very arduous supporter of child assistance policies, the extreme right in Poland. So, in, and, and this same, same true in Erdogan has done quite a bit of uh, housing and health care policies for the poor in Turkey. Modi in India has not merely continued with the earlier government's uh, pro-poor policies of jobs, 
uh, guarantees and, and food security, Modi has not merely continued, but introduced some new policies, welfare policies for the poor. So this co-optation of left issues, except for the United States, is I think an important issue. So the, so the going to the, uh, so in a sense, uh, the wind is taken out of the sail of the left in some cases. But more than that, I would say the, one of the reasons this has happened is because of the decline of trade unions. If in the past, uh, there was one organization, one type of organization which resisted rigged capitalism, it was the trade unions. And I would say they also played, and I'm going to come back to that, they also played an important role, cultural role, not just the economic resistance to rigged capitalism. They used to play a cultural role in the sense that trade unions used to, used to tame and transcend these ugly passions that the demagogues are rousing. So trade unions is to uh, tame and transcend extreme uh, racism, extreme uh, anti-immigrant policies, and so on. And not all trade unions, but many trade unions used to, uh, used to do that. And in a sense, channel working class uh, complaints and grievances in a more uh, in a more economic direction and even culturally what they provided was an anchor for pride in shared work a shared identity and it's a cultural identity not just an economic identity and with the decline of trade unions there is a void and in that cultural void the demagogues with their quote unquote, culture wars filled in, came in. And so I, I think the decline of trade unions, I can go into why the trade unions have declined, but let me, I don't have time for that, but I, uh, in my book I discuss this. I think that is a major reason why uh, the right, um, uh, sorry, yeah, the right wing kind of uh, appropriated that area. And meanwhile, Something that's happened with, because of globalization, and that's where the economics come in. What globalization has done, earlier the system was, particularly in rich countries, it was a rent sharing between big capital and big labor. With globalization, with competition, international trade increasing, rents declined. So the rents to share declined. But in that decline of rent, capital, asymmetrically gained compared to labor. Because capital could wield, uh, wield the threat that if you don't accept their deal, they're going to go somewhere else. So it's this mobility of capital with globalization, particularly financial capital, they held on to their bargaining power, labor lost out. And since labor lost out, they're not Doing, uh, providing a good deal for the workers, the workers moved away. So that's, I would say, a major economic reason why they moved away, but I want to emphasize it's not just economic. As a result of the decline of trade unions, something, there's a cultural void. The third thing, and here, you'd often, if you, if you um, hear the rhetoric of the demagogues, it's often anti-elitist, but to me, it's very important to keep in mind which elite are they against. It's not the financial elite. I've already told you, one of the first things they do is reduce the taxes of the rich, reduce the regulations. What they're trying to rouse people, rouse workers against is the cultural elite, the liberal elite, not the financial elite. Uh, so in India, Modi will tell you about the Indians in the audience would know about the term, the Khan Market Gang. Khan Market Gang is a particular area in, in New Delhi where the liberals gather, the India International Center, kind of. He's not rousing people against Ambani's and Adani's who happen to be his friends. 
So it's not against the financial elite, it's the cultural elite, it's the liberal elite. And not just, I just gave the example of Modi, the same in Trump's case, in the, uh, in the other, other, Victor Orban's case and so on. Here there's one difference though between rich and poor countries. I think just let me quickly mention. In general, the idea is that in rich countries, the right wing leaders have got the support of generally older people, less educated people, and rural people. That is not true in general in the world. So for example, in, the, in India, Modi's support to a large extent, not entirely, but to a large extent among the urban aspirational youth. And it is also, in, the difference is very interesting that whereas Brexit support in this country was in the Midlands, not in London, in the Midlands, in Modi's India, the more uh, affluent areas like Gujarat, like Maharashtra, like Karnataka, were big supporters of Modi. Not necessarily less educated, more rural, etc. So what, the more think about it, this is not entirely be, can be explained by economic things. I think there's a cultural pattern. And the cultural pattern, I want to particularly emphasize two issues. In rich countries, the cultural uh, anger is against immigrants, anti-immigration. In many poor countries, but not just poor countries, the cultural insecurity is around religious issues or religious majoritarian nationalism issues. Let me spend one or two minutes on, the, on that. So immigration is, uh, is, is a problem in Europe and United States that's uh, well known to you. I immigration, of course, is an economic issue as well, but I'm at the moment uh, concentrating of the immigrant, uh, immigrants bringing culturally alien norms and so on. Uh, but the techniques are very similar between developing countries where immigration is not the problem and rich countries. And that is, in both, it takes a majoritarian form in which there is a manufactured victimhood of the majority. So you know about the right-wing theories, now quite widely circulated among the right-wing intellectuals, right-wing theory of the great replacement. These uh, minorities, the immigrants, are going to replace us, the majority. So there's a manufactured victimhood. You hear that in the developing countries as well. In, in India, they will tell you, you see, Muslims maybe 14, 15%, Hindus maybe 80%, but look at the Muslim woman's fertility rate. That's what they will tell you. I keep on telling them, look, the Muslim woman's fertility rate in the state of Kerala is lower than the Hindu woman's fertility rate in Uttar Pradesh. So the primary determinant of fertility is the woman's education, not religion. But you will not hear about that among the right wing all the time. The great replacement, the same great replacement which is applied in the context of immigration and, and racial minorities in the rich countries, same kind of great replacement. In context, in developing countries, there are other kinds of cultural insecurity issues which religion provides. And that is with a lot of economic displacement that is going on, plus scarcity of jobs, there's a lot of anxiety. And in times of tension and anxiety, you need an anchor. So increasingly in India, for example, you will see even very low caste people, I'm not talking about the high caste who have religion, high caste is the major uh, electorally support group of Modi, but low, even among low caste groups, which are, as they are coming up, but with the uncertainties and dislocations, they want a cultural anchor in religion. Quite often, uh, there's a whole process on which sociologists have written about that you turn to religion, not even though you are not religious to start with. 
So this is a kind of cultural insecurity that I have in mind, but similar kind of thing, as I mentioned, in the, in the context of uh, rich country. Uh, another thing is that this, these anxieties, uh, etc., in all this, in harvesting this anxiety, the right wing dominates the cultural narrative. In a way, this, the others, the op those who are opposing the right wing, have no way, at the moment at least, of controlling that narrative. Quite often, the left and the liberals talk class politics, whereas uh, the right wing talk, is talking about culture wars. So for example, workers are often united in the demand for minimum wage. So economically, they're agreed. But the workers are divided on cultural issues, whether it's abortion, uh, gay rights, in the peculiar case of the United States, gun rights. Um, so uh, on cultural issues, workers are divide, divided. And this is also reflects all kinds of division within working classes. Partly, working class is largely divided between the professional workers, knowledge economy workers, and the blue collar workers. And, and this uh, division and cultural division reflects uh, that kind of division. And lastly, I'm going to uh, finish the first part of um, my talk there on this question, why they are turning right rather than left. Uh, all these anxieties and tensions, of course, amplified by social media. And you might say, well, the left and liberals can also use the so do use the social media. But I think there's a big asymmetry there. And I'll just refer you to one empirical finding where you see why the right wing have an inherent advantage in spreading lies, outrageous things. Of course, the business model of social media is the more outrageous the lie, the more it's likely to get viral. And of course, social media companies will make more money. But what is the evidence? I saw a study uh, studying the impact in social media of false news spread in the three months before the 2016 presidential election in the United States. So false news favoring Trump were re uh, recirculated, repeated, spread through the social media, in this case, in the studies, face only Facebook, 30 million times in the three months before 2016 election. There are also false news spread favoring Hillary Clinton, but they've spread only 8 million times in that study. So that tells you the right wing has an inherent advantage and it's consistent with the business model of the social media company. Run up eight minutes. OK, thank you. Um, so I'm now going to move to the second part about policy issues. The second part is full of all kinds of policies. But let me tell you uh, what my major focus is on. Um, my major focus is on, uh, on, on labor. I come, I'll come back to trade unions. One is that um, I, I very much support. This, these are ways of modifying capitalism without giving up on capitalism. In a sense, you might accuse me, those who don't like capitalism you might accuse me, I'm trying to save capitalism from the capitalists. Just as on the democracy front, I'm trying to save democracy from majoritarians. Because majoritarians think, of course, they are the majority, so they are the Democrats. So I'm trying to save democracy from the majoritarians and capitalism from the capitalists. Capitalism to me is important because of innovations. There's a whole lot of things that I discuss about different types of innovations that you can be labor friendly and yet without hurting profits, you can increase productivity. And of course, if we look at the global index of innovations, United States is of course high, but so is Germany, where uh, in some sense, workers have a much more voice. Uh, by the way, I should mention it, I was planning to mention it, but I'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, Scandinavian countries are very high on global and index of innovations. 
So for, to be labor friendly, you don't have to give up on innovations. The German case to me is very interesting. Uh, most of you may know about the works councils. Today, and actually for quite some time, the largest companies in Germany in the top governing board, half, really half, which is astonishing compared to other countries and compared to the United States, half is made by worker representation, representatives. And as a result, women are much more important in German comp uh, corporate governance than in most other rich countries. So, and, as, and this has not just improved the dignity and autonomy of workers, but it has also an economic effect. And this is something that to me is very important. In what way innovations are going to move, not the rate of innovation, but the pattern of innovation. Darren Esimolu has written on this, that the, at the moment, the innovations are all in the labor replacing direction. And he says, it is not inevitable. You can redirect the innovation to a labor empowering, labor uh, absorbing direction. And for that, if workers have a voice, they'll have, they have a chance. Similarly, workers have a, have a voice, they will have, uh, uh, if they can have a seat in the international negotiations of uh, uh, trade treaties and investment rules, that will, uh, relieve some of the distrust that workers have on globalization among the rank and file uh, workers. If they have a say in which way the international trade uh, treaties will go, at the moment the trade treaties and investment rules are almost entirely decided by corporate lobbies. So one needs to change that focus. The other thing I discuss, there's a whole section, public funding of elections. I'm very much in favor of that. Of course, in the worst case of big money in politics, big money in elections, the worst case among the countries that I'm interested in, particularly, is the United States and India. I think there's a lot to learn. It's not easy to do, but there's a lot to learn from uh, the cases of public funding of elections in France, Spain, Belgium, um, uh, Sweden, and Canada. Okay, sorry, then I have to uh, wind up. Essentially, uh, the book, the, the second part of the book is about all kinds of policies to modify capitalism without giving up on uh, the, uh, some of the dynamism that follows from capitalism. And let me end by saying that these policies, I have no illusion that they're easy to do. They probably will not, will, will, they're so difficult, and this probably will not happen. But the book is suffused with what I call in the book a spirit of upbeat skepticism. You push for things to get better, knowing fully well they may not. So I, and let me end with a quotation from something the Italian intellectual Antonio Gramsci wrote from Mussolini's prison. He says he has the pessimism of the intellect, but the optimism of the will. Some, in, in some sense, my book reflects that. Thank you. And you can sit here. Okay, let me quickly introduce Martin Wolf. Um, his formal title Associate Editor and Chief Economics Commentator at the Financial Times, but that formal title uh, does not get to the substance, which is that he's probably the most influential economic commentator in the Anglosphere of the world. Um, he's won all kinds of prizes, um, which I won't uh, elaborate, except that the one of them, the 2019 Lifetime Achievement Award at the Gerald Loeb Award. Um, he was on, a member of the UK Independent Commission on Banking in 2010-11, a commission which tried to figure out what on earth to do to stop having yet another one of these great financial crises. Um, and his most recent publication, just this year, is called The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, 
which is to say echoes rather closely the theme of Pranab's book. So, uh, Martin, you have um, 12 minutes. Okay. First of all, it's an immense pleasure to be here and an honor. Since I have a fair number of things to say, I will get down to it. Um, first of all, overall, I think this book is uh, rather an astonishing achievement in the sense that it is to me, it's simply astonishingly ambitious, erudite, and comprehensive. Um, and even more remarkably for an academic economist, sensible. Um, uh, and that he managed to get all this into 200 pages without any charts, uh, uh, footnotes, is a model to us all, which in my latest book, which Pranav has actually reviewed, I certainly didn't follow. So that's admirable. What I want to address, and so if you want an overview of this debate by a very, very intelligent and informed, immensely well-read person, this is the book to read. I really do think that. The second, then I want to ask a few questions. And I'll see how far I get into them before Robert closes me down. So the first question, which I think is very important, is does the book provide a convincing explanation of the democratic recession, as it's been called, and the rise of autocracy illiberal majoritarianism and so forth. And my answer is yes, but only up to a point. I agree that a sense of economic and cultural insecurity is important. But the question I think that he ducks somewhat is why now? It's very, very clear from the evidence to me that this backsliding on democracy has, which has been progressive and, and ongoing and frightening, began sometime in the early, uh, in the early to middle part, and uh, the middle part of the first decade of this century. Not so much far from the financial crisis, though some of the evidence preceded it. And the question is, to my mind, is why has this happened now? And my view in my book is economic factors have played a big part in that in the high income countries, particularly the financial crisis. And there's a lot of literature to suggest financial crises tend to generate the populist reactions we see uh, now. But I would add something which only occurred to me in reading this wonderful book is that there's probably significant cross-country contagion and particularly legitimization of right-wing populism by, as a result of what has happened in core democratic countries, and particularly the United States. Would Modi have been able to behave quite as he did if Trump hadn't been prime minister, a uh, president, that's a Freudian slip, of the US? Question. So that's the first. Second, how well does Pranab analyze the key relationship between capitalism and democracy, which I struggled with. And I think, again, he did so well up to a point. He says that capitalism seems to be neither a necessary nor sufficient condition in our world for democracy. And I think, if you look at the evidence, oh, so overall, I agree. But the association is pretty strong. Historically, two centuries ago, before the capitalist revolution, there weren't any democracies. Where did they come from and why? And contemporaneously, of course, there is the giant exception, I'll come to this in exception of China, and the trivial exception of Singapore, we can discuss that, but basically, uh, rich capitalist countries are democracies. And some of them are remarkable transitions in the recent past, like Taiwan and Korea, which Robert is in. Um, an expert on. And I think he could have said more about that. Of course, he would have had more text. Third question, does the book provide a balanced account of the relative merits of democracy and Chinese autocratic communism? And my answer on that is yes, unambiguously. I think that's an outstanding section, very balanced. It, his argument that a lot of what China did in terms of decentralization and rewards for officials 
from their local success is replicable elsewhere, and the vulnerability of the Chinese system to corruption, and as we see increasingly recently to unaccountable despotism, is worrying not only for the Chinese, but for the world. And I love his persistent belief and attachment to democracy, which goes with this critique, and I think that section is completely out, is really outstanding. I agree with it completely. Fourth, does the book is really wedded to social democracy in, in particular general and the Nordic model of social democracy in particular? And does he justify his belief in this? And here I think the answer is yes and no. It is right to know that the Nordics in particular, and to some extent the Netherlands, Germany, and Austria in Northern Europe, have created a rather unique model of markets, politics, and community. But he doesn't really address the question on how far this depended on their small size and cultural and ethnic homogeneity. And as we're seeing, even in countries like Sweden and Finland, uh, there's a pretty vigorous backlash of a right-wing nature uh, as these countries are coping with large-scale immigration in particular. For the countries which are much more diverse, much bigger, uh, much more complex like the US, is the social democratic model relevant at all? That, I think, is a question he needs to address, and the same applies in spades to uh, India. Um, then uh, the, sorry, uh, this, my wonderful thing is now going completely mad, as only a computer can. Um, the, the question then is, can we create a social democratic coalition in the current world, and how would it work? Um, I'm not going to talk about developing countries, because I think that is just too big an issue, and the question of what social democracy would look like in India, for example, is beyond me. But think about it in our case, and this is the question he has to answer. It's pretty clear, and I can't go into why it's happened, this is towards, I only have one other big question, is um, it's pretty clear that a key part of what has happened, and he discusses this well, is that people like you, mostly, namely educated um, uh, uh, people who work in the knowledge industries, broadly defined, have become an enormously much larger part of our society than they used to be. I discuss that in my book. And they have interests and attitudes and values of their own, which he discusses, particularly related to identity politics and a lot of other things. And in the process, they have lost the adhesion to and sympathy of a large part of the working class, which has been downwardly mobile. And without recreating that coalition, you can't get to social democracy. It's as simple as that. That's the only workable social democratic coalition. And the conservatives have got a very large part of the latter. And they have created what he's described and I refer to in my book as the Southern strategy. It's a sort of stark way of thinking about the coalition they've created between the plutocracy and the angry working class. He doesn't really discuss how this coalition can be reformed. And I doubt whether it can. So my view is any the sorts of policies he wants to get will have to come out of a coalition of social democrats, liberal democrats, and leftish conservative people. That's what my book addresses. And for that to happen, you need to have a political structure that makes them a potent force in politics. And the one that gets closest to that is the sort of proportional representation you see in Germany. And the current coalition in Germany is the closest you can imagine to that coalition. It won't be revolutionary enough for Brunab, but it's the only way I think you can do the transformation. The final question I have 
which is leaps out from this book, and there are innumerable other ones, is Renab wants a lot of good global stuff to happen too. Climate change has to be fixed. We have to deal with pandemics and all this effectively. To do that, we need a more effective global order. And to, to achieve an effective global order, the Western world and China has to cooperate pretty intensely. I perfectly well understand that he couldn't go into that in the space of his book. But without it, there will be no global solutions. And I would really like to know how he thinks that he's going to pull that one off. So there are lots of questions, but my view is, and things I don't, don't agree with, a great book starts, the consequence of reading a great book is it raises all sorts of questions in minds about why or where or how it might be wrong. And in this case, Pranab, Pranab has achieved that, in my mind, perfectly. Thank you very much. So let me introduce now um, Tim Bentley, who is, in his formal title, is school professor of economics and political science. So he's both. Tell me about it nicely. Um, and he is the Sir uh, Arthur Lewis Professor of Development Economics as well at LSE. Um, so one of his important uh, institution affiliations was that he was a member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee um, before and during uh, the great, um, what we call global financial crisis, which we should call the North Atlantic financial crisis. Correct. Um, and so he was right in the hot seat of handling that uh, crisis. Um, he's also now currently on the UK National Infrastructure Commission, also the UK government's levelling up advisory council. So he uh, has not only made major contributions to a distinct political economy, not economic, but political economy, but he's also been heavily involved in some of these uh, public policy um, uh, uh, institutions. Um, Tim. Thank you very much, <coughs> Robert. And, and I, I guess uh, um, I'm, I may fall into the trap that Martin raised because I'm an academic economist. I'm not going to be sensible. Uh, at least that's what I'm led to think. But I'm going to try and be sensible. And I'm going to begin by thanking Pranab both for coming here for his book and for the, uh, during the pandemic, every Monday morning, I used to get an email, as many did, from Pranab as he was writing his autobiography. And uh, I was, couldn't wait till the next Monday to get the latest installment. And he tells me today it's coming out as a book, so I'm very much looking forward to that. But today we're talking about his, uh, his book on, uh, on an age of insecurity, which I, I will echo what Martin said, is a remarkable book, and, and I do commend it to you. Um, I, I've got about five points to make, but I'll just stop when, when Robert shows me um, uh, that, that, that I have to, to finish. Let me begin by saying, I, I, and, and I think Pranab agrees with this, but he, but he doesn't really subscribe to it throughout his book. I, I just think the term democracy has become not very useful as a way of describing um, the, the heterogeneity we see in political systems across the world. It's already been misused for many years to stand for two quite distinct but importantly complementary ideas. One is the process of the access to power. Um, so a democratic system has a particular way, say, compared to an aristocratic system of putting people in power, normally an electoral process. Um, but the other is the way it constrains the use of power by judicial constraints and parliamentary constraints. And in fact, when you look in the data, and I've spent quite a lot of time doing this, partly provoked by reading Pranab's book, um, what you don't really see according to formal measures of democracy, whether you look at the Varadis Democracy Project or the Polity Project, is much evidence of this so-called democratic recession. Now, we see it when we look at specific countries. If we study Turkey or we study the US, but it's everywhere. It's like what people used to say about the internet. The democratic recession is everywhere, but in the data that we use. That doesn't mean we, ha we aren't living in a world where there are some remarkable changes. And they've been highlighted both by Martin and by 
um, and by Pranab, and they do demand an explanation of the kind I think that, that Martin put his uh, finger on when he said, why now? But the two developments that I would particularly draw attention to are the rise of radical right voting, which is very clearly in the data, um, and the other um, is the rise of protest, which neither um, Pranab nor Martin uh, mentioned. But if you look after 2010, and whether you look in supposedly autocratic or supposedly democratic societies, you've seen a huge increase in popular protest. And I'm coming back in a minute to link that. There's some very interesting studies of why protest has been increasing. Um, but I do think it's linked to some of the issues around insecurity and discontent, if you want to call it that, um, within um, different political systems. But going to the sort of why now, I put a lot of weight on something Martin did mention, which is a kind of unintended uh, effect of the increase in mass education being a huge driver of why we landed where we did now. Now, when we've measured traditional inequality measures, we tend to do it, that's a, inherently a hierarchical measure, namely we have more or less. So, but people who should be thinking about education, not in terms of inequality, but in terms of polarization. And what we know from the literature on the measurement of polarization, the worst place to be in polarization is roughly at 50. Now, that wouldn't matter tremendously if there weren't huge and deep cleavages in the views of those who have tertiary education and those who don't. But again, if you look in data, the European Value Survey, the World Value Survey, you'll find at least two dimensions, well, possibly three, on which there are dramatic differences between the views of those who have tertiary education and those who don't. Immigration has been mentioned as one, absolutely huge differences. The second is climate. There's very big differences between educated, uh, those who are educated to tertiary level. And you have to look at tertiary education. Secondary education, you don't get the same cleavage. And the third is views about redistribution. Educated people, on average, have less redistributive preferences than people who are not tertiary educated. So three big areas of polarization. If you put those together in measures, where does polarization peak? It peaks when 50% of the population are on either side of the divide. So unwittingly, in many countries, we are heading towards a world where throughout Europe we have roughly 50-50 um, uh, um, higher education uh, levels by now. Um, and we are, we are going to see an increase in educational polarization and therefore fragmentation of views. And, and, and Martin, I think, is spot on when he says, how are we going to respond to this? How are we going to build meaningful political coalitions? And I think that's the challenge that Pranav very much has in his policy responses. In a world where we have to believe fragmentation of that kind or polarization of that kind is probably going to get worse before it gets better as we continue for very good reasons to educate uh, our populations. And I think it's an entirely unanticipated consequence of education that we have increased polarization in our society. But of course it's not the only thing that's been going on and this links to the decline of unions. We've uh, Most of the, um, the Western world broadly defined, have, been lo have lost many of the jobs that were traditionally unionized jobs. Now, of course, they were traditionally male jobs, too, so there's another, another element of uh, polarization opened up there um, uh, uh, along, along uh, gender, gender lines. Um, but those changes in the economy are things that we're trying to work through. And of course, they were all exacerbated by globalization. They're being exacerbated by technology. So these are the things we have to respond to and build this, uh, this new coalition. At the same time, as, as Pranav points out, and there's some very nice work on this, for example, by Simon Hicks, who used to be in the government department here, on the decline of social democracy. Basically, social democratic parties have been losing votes pretty much around the world where they existed, suggesting that whatever people are doing when they're responding to these forces, be they um, changes in the economy or changes in they're not turning to social democrat parties. But I'm not so sure that that's, the, that's what we want to reconstruct. I think social democracy as it emerged most in its sort of most uh, um, uh, clear form in, I say, Western Europe in the post-Second World War period was inherently an elitist model. It was about people, educated elites, doing the best they could with some element of working class representation. I'm not denying that. But it was a model which really didn't 
assume parity of esteem between the governance and the, and, and the, and the governed. And so I'm, I'm skeptical about that, that route. I'm also skeptical about proportional representation, I should say. In countries that have proportional representation, we have the rise of the Sweden Democrats, we have the rise of the AFD. We, of course, the, the, the UKIP in this country managed to get a referendum, but they didn't get it on the basis of having political representation. So you could, you could still say, uh, we got Brexit because of our political system. But either way, I'm not entirely convinced. What, and if you go back to James Madison, who wrote extensively about this at the dawn of American democracy, his view is that the value of majoritarianism was it gave the strongest incentives to create the broadest base coalitions. And maybe we're failing on that. But I think if we're failing on that, we have to put a lot, of, a lot more weight than I think Pranav does, and I don't know about Martin because he hasn't uh, spoken about this, on the, 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 the negative role played by presidential. I think in parliamentary systems, we have a far better chance of creating those large coalitions than a country like the US, which is hamstrung, I think, by the presidential system now. I don't think you would get nearly the degree of emerging polarization you get in the US if it had a parliamentary system. The key feature of the parliamentary system being you only govern if you can command a majority of support in parliament. Um, and that has always had a, a very important moderating effect, both in pr proportional systems and in, and in parliamentary systems. But I think that, for me, is what's missing. And if you look at uh, US in global context, um, the US is beginning to look more and more like Latin America than it is like Western Europe. And that's what worries me a great deal. Europe, um, the US for many years you could hold up as almost a unique example of successful presidentialism. I hope if we were back here in 20 years we'd still be saying that. But the, the evidence from presidential systems around the world, be in Latin America, be in Africa and other places, is they have not been very good at building broad-based political so I think that's something we should also put weight on. My final point I want to make is on technology. Um, I, I think technology is key to thinking about the world of insecurity we live in. I think it's wrong to think of that exclusively as about the labor market, although clearly there are threats. I mean, it won't be very long till my lectures can be taught by a hologram far better than I can teach them. Um, but the real um, insecurity is coming from disrupting, I think, social capital. And I think this has been hugely exacerbated by the pandemic, where people now routinely think they can work from home. Workplaces were crucially places that built social capital among, work, among people having to get on and work together in person, understanding each other, um, and was a bulwark against, um, against uh, um, some forms, I think, of extreme ideologies as people learn to, to, to live with each other. And I think the fact that social media is so clearly being destructive in every sense, whether it's Zoom calls instead of in-person meetings, or just people being able to say insulting things, non-factually based insulting things. And I think if we don't collectively, and this is where I say, where's that grand coalition come from, get on top of the implications of the digitization of our world, I think the world is, I can, I can be extremely pessimistic about what happens next. I think we start, have to start to think about the digital world like we used to think about public utilities. These are things that have to be run for the social good of the citizens. There was a time when we were happy to have public utilities in the hands of private firms. Um, and it's about time we had a, a real joined up debate, I think, about what is the status of all of these firms that are control the digital world and whether we, and it'll only be done at the level of nation states at the moment, want to regulate them as public utilities for the public good, or let it be this entire wild west that we've unleashed of, the di of, of, of um, technology and, uh, and the digital world. So I'm sure I by now have uh, lived up to Martin's expectations of uh, not giving you a sensible suggestions, but I think uh, these are the issues that, that, that uh, provoked by listening, to, uh, by listening to Pranav and also reading his really excellent book. Okay, um, I'm still in a state of shock hearing you uh, uh, both in, um, imply that the first past the post electoral system is, is a better, uh, sorry, uh, hearing you, Tim, not Martin, uh, is a better electoral system. 
then as a source of representation. However, um, I agree with him completely on presidentialism. Okay. I wrote a column on that, by the way. Okay. But okay. I d just wonder, before we open it up, um, do you want to um, come back on Brief. some of their points? Yeah. You should be able to do that in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Martin is right, actually. He raised such very important questions that it, you really require a lot of time to think over and also uh, to give uh, any answer. So I'm not going to try that. Um, but just uh, one or two rambling thoughts. Um, uh, why now? Very important question. I think maybe because I'm talking about both rich and poor countries, and since I come from a poor country, I was th thinking that the thing about right-wing extremism in countries like India, uh, Hindu nationalism in India, the Hindu nationalist organization, which is getting more and more powerful, started in 1923. So this is the 100th year of RSS, the cultural organization which has produced Modi. He spent most of his young life in that organization. So it's a long thing. It's not why now. The, some of these cultural insecurity issues that I just barely hinted at is a long standing thing. It's not just since the financial crisis. Um, but even in rich countries, I would say yes, the financial crisis certainly and the austerity policies in reaction uh, caused a lot of anxieties. But I think of the issue of immigration, the anti-immigrant part of the demagogue's mobilization of anxiety is not post-financial crisis. The anti-immigration issue has been there for quite some time in rich countries as well. So yes, I think it's a relevant question, why now? But probably it's not all that it's the economics of financial crisis in 2000. Eight, nine. I think it, it, in some of these issues go longer. Most, so many of the other things that Martin mentioned, I actually agree with, but let me just, a uh, few things that I want to point, and then I'll come to Tim's comments. I think Martin is a very important question. I've actually, in a different context, I mentioned this. This issue that's brought out, what is the coalition? that is going to bring out change. And I think nobody has an answer. Nobody has an answer. And much more generally, as an academic economist, and I've written a long time on institutional economics, I think one of the major failures of institutional economics is, or at least not satisfactory answers, is yes, we now know what kind of institution help development or broad-based welfare but we don't know how to bring those institutions about. And what kind of coalitions work in some context, historically contingent context, and what doesn't. And I think he's quite right that I don't have anything in the, my book really to suggest that kind of coalition because I myself don't know. However, having said that, let me mention something that I think is extremely important not today, bringing it about today, but probably in near future. Something that I give a lot of emphasis on, didn't elaborate in my book. The reason I was thinking of trade unions, I think of trade unions not just in the sense of a wage bargaining institution, but a more comprehensive ins institution of a particular kind. Let me give you the name of a book called Associations and Democracy which was edited by, uh, uh, which was written and then commented by others by Joshua Cohen, the philosopher, political philosopher, and Joel Rogers, Rogers, the sociologist. So their book, I think, rightly emphasizes that today we have to think about not the economists usually think about the state and the market, or even political scientists talk about the state and the citizen. But there are many intermediate institutions between the state and the citizen that if we can develop them that ultimately enrich democracy. And this is what their associational group 
So what kind of associations they have mind? Of course, trade unions. They also talk about works councils, like the German works councils that I mentioned. They talk about neighborhood associations, parent-teacher groups. Uh, I can add, in developing countries, I myself have done some empirical work on this. If you think about peasant agriculture, irrigation is very important, and irrigation societies, or water user associations, is another example of an intermediate institution. Forest management committees, intermediate institutions. Why am I talking about this? I think if instead of just keeping looking at the state and the citizen, the individual citizen, if you think and develop some of these intermediate institutions, trade unions included, it will not get immediate result, but over time, it will enrich democracy, and also it will increase the resilience of democracy, because they will resist uh, the, the, the recession that people are talking about. Uh, but Just in, repeat the, author, the, the title and the authors again. The title is, if I remember right, Associations and Democracy. It's actually part of a, uh, this, uh, his uh, died recently, the, the Marxist uh, sociologist, Eric Olin Wright. He had a long project called Real Utopias. So he was thinking of projects in which, which are not immediately doable, but it is doable in some sense, not immediately achievable, not, I shouldn't say immediately achievable. So they're not immediately achievable, but if you give it time, if you really work for it, it might work. So that's the Real Utopias project. First volume of that project, is associations and democracy. The whole book is about how to develop a different kind of democracy, which is strengthened by these uh, intermediate associations. Um, on Martin's <laughs> even more difficult question, what to do today in the geopolitical situation that we are in, I have no clue. In fact, he's absolutely right that my book doesn't even mention it. Uh, so, but, but all I ho I'm hoping Two things that I mentioned in that context will not answer uh, Martin's question. One is these geopolitical tensions arise partly, not just because of the two superpower uh, conflict, but also partly the way we think about nationalism ultimately. And in my book, I have a whole chapter on nationalism, and I talk about most of the nationalism that we hear about is ethnic nationalism, one kind or another religion, ethnicity, etc. But the other kind of nationalism is civic nationalism. And I often wonder if sufficient number of countries in the world remain nation states, but the nationalism is based on civic values uh, rather than ethnicity. Uh, the, the German philosopher uh, Habermas talks about constitutional patriotism. That's the term he's used but he's talking about essentially civic nationalism. So I often wonder, this is just a speculation, if countries can get organized in civic nationalism terms, would that relieve part of the geo geopolitical tension that arises out of extreme uh, nationalism? Um, Chinese case, of course, is, in fact, the China, the, the, one of the ugly features is not just authoritarianism, Ultranationalism is, is a very important. Uh, so I think we have to think about nationalism uh, much more generally, whether it can. The other issue is um, uh, on the geopolitical front is that I'm still hopeful that if you th go back to the earlier Cold War, I, I, most of my youth was spent the, during the Cold War days, uh, even with these hostilities, between the two superpowers at that time, under the radar maybe sometimes, there are a lot of agreements that were made uh, between the two superpowers and including others. And maybe over time, we can think of agreements, not perfect ones, but with compromises, even with this otherwise, the superpowers uh, uh, hostile to each other. Uh, they may be possible to have some international coordination. I'm still hopeful that international coordination on environment may be workable, even though the Chinese are otherwise hostile to many of the US actions. So we have to think about possibilities, even with the geopolitical tensions. 
let me come quickly to Tim's comments. I, I almost entirely agreed uh, with what uh, you said, Tim. Uh, just two comments, not really uh, answering your questions. Two comments is, you mentioned about the, that this is the period, not merely the democ uh, things we're talk discussing, uh, democratic uh, uh, disenchantment, but this is also the period popular protest that you mentioned. I have one comment on that. I think sometimes uh, popular protests are coming up because the democratic procedures are clogged. So they go out in the street. Certainly happening in India. India, the democratic processes are, I, I don't consider India a democratic country anymore, but the, demo, the usual procedures of democracy are clogged. So when you have to protest Modi, you have to come up into the street. That's what the farmers did in India. Uh, large numbers of farmers came out and blocked roads for whole year, one whole year. So, and Chile, Many of the popular protests in Chile, also because the usual political pro representative democracy processes are not working well. So I think popular protest is a symptom of maybe of fail some failures of democracy. Maybe uh, 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 that's one thing that you might think about. Can the other issue. Right up, I'll be showing Martin the hockey stick, which I have printed out here. That's protest, and you see it really go up dramatically. Sure, sure. Wait a second, just show, just explain it a bit more for the audience. So basically this is the, the amount of protest in the world, and you can see it basically is flat, and this is 2010. These are using two different measures, one of riots, one of protests, and you get this enormous takeoff in protests beginning in after 2010. 2010. Yeah, yeah, which is, as Martin immediately said, after the financial crisis. <laughs> yeah. The North Atlantic financial crisis. <laughs> 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 <Atlantic financial. laughs> but it's really striking, it doesn't get a lot of play. I don't know how many people here knew that that's what the data showed. No, I, I'm not questioning the data at all. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that in trying to understand why, uh, I don't think it's just the financial crisis. I, I wouldn't I think say that either, <laughs> but it's rather intriguing. Yes, yes. But this is also the period which democratic procedures declined, got clogged, and therefore you have to go out in the streets to protest. Uh, so anyway, uh, the only other thing, uh, take, taking too much time, of, of Q&A time, is um, uh, on the issue of the education and uh, you related to the why now and the, 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 uh, the tertiary education, etc. In fact, this reminded me of, uh, you all are familiar with Toma, my friend Toma Piketty's description of the Brahmin left mm -hmm. um, and the merchant right, if we use the Hindu uh, continued the Hindu time with the Baniya right and the Brahmin. Uh, but I think Toma is a bit unfair to the uh, knowledge workers, professional workers, by calling them Brahmin left. Because it, this group is also happens to be more sympathetic with the marginalized groups of society, like immigrants, like uh, my, race, racial minorities. Uh, so compared to the non-Brahmin workers. Uh, so I think education does something which, yes, in the, in the short run it will be polarized, hopefully as a lot, lot more people get more educated, uh, that will be different. But the India is a counter example, as I said, that it's not just the less educated, it's the highly educated people, urban youth, are going for Modi. So one has to be careful uh, which way the education uh, is going to work. You know, sometimes people say a little learning is a dangerous thing. <laughs> it can go the other way. Sorry, thank you. Pranav, just uh, one, one minute uh, more. Um, oh, you the presidential, I had something to say about the presidential. Can I, just one second? Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> because both of them raised the issue of presidential, particularly Tim. Yeah. Um, uh, I somehow don't agree with him on that. Uh, in a sense, the, prime min the parliamentary systems are moving toward presidential. Look what, in many of these, Modi certainly does it, but in many countries where the prime minister is turning elections into referenda on the prime minister. So essentially, quite often elections in this context that we are discussing, elections have become essentially referenda on the charisma of the leader, not 
issues, performance, performance. So this can happen even in first past the post parliamentary systems. Sorry, you were saying something? Yeah, so just an, an analytical point. That is, you make a lot uh, about the distinction between income inequality, inequality and income insecurity. And I'm just wondering uh, whether you have suggestions for how to measure this distinction and in particular identify the effects of income insecurity as distinct from income inequality. There's a, obviously a complex relationship between the two things. Right. Now, uh, if you're talking about, I, I went a lot on this cultural insecurity, but obviously you mean the economic insecurity, yes. right? So, yes, economic insecurity is more difficult to measure, but I, I, for example, the reason I come to it is that if you th think about the occupation Wall, Wall Street movement and then there were uh, echoing movement in uh, uh, other parts of the world, but if you think the original one in New York, they were essentially saying 1% versus the rest 99%. And I'm saying it's not so simple like that. I, I would say that the working classes don't have any idea about how the working class 1% uh, operate, how they make money, uh, there's a lifestyle or anything. So not many know nothing, they dare not exercise about that. They're interested in what is happening to their own lives, as I mentioned before. And there, insecurity, how do you measure? So economic insecurity kind of thing is obvious. They're meeting um, job insecurity. There, and in fact, I mentioned it in my book, that they're worried not just job, their own jobs. They're worried about what kind of jobs their children are going to get uh, when they grow up. So there's this work that Rab Chetty and his co-authors have done in the, if with, the, with the US data. They show that people with the 1940 cohort, when they grow up to be 90, uh, 30, uh, in their 30s, do how, what chance they have for exceeding the income of their parents. The 1940 cohort had 90% chance. Whereas the 1980 cohort of exceeding their parents' income has dropped to 50%. And over time, it's probably drop even more. So there is an, and this is related to intergenerational inequality. And th this is where a lot of anxiety of parents, even if you, you have a side job, you're worried about, your children, the job safety, etc. So measurement, if you ask crude measurement, we can do it very easily. We know about the unemployment rate, underemployment rates, etc. We give you some measure of job insecurity. But what we cannot measure is the cultural insecurity. Let me stop there. Okay. Okay. So we have a, a little bit of time before the great book signing um, outside. Um, who would like to ask? Professor Bardhan and yeah. yeah, my name is Providendra. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much to all of you for this very thought-provoking talk. Uh, Professor Bardhan, would you agree that on the left, there are far too many factions. Ideology-wise, perhaps, there is far too much variation, and which kind of unintentionally created some sort of cognitive dissonance for the common people. And if you look at the right, on the other hand, across countries, they are focusing simply on something like overt nationalism, right? And if you agree, do you see there is a linkage between that cognitive dissonance and this insecurity that you're referring to? Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, when you were talking about... Sorry, you oh, my name's Nabiha. Um, when you were talking about um, insecurity, one of the things that came to my mind was the concept of shame and shamelessness and how economic insecurity might lead to a sense of shame within a particular group, especially the working class. 
And I think that can also offer an explanation as to why the right, in the right, it's mostly um, things like anti-immigration that unites people and within countries like India, it's uh, religious minorities because that's the way that they can frame an enemy and then um, exonerate themselves out of shame. So from this framework, do you think that policymakers should focus on addressing shame that people feel or do you think ec addressing policies that, sorry, devising policies that address economic insecurity can ultimately lead to a sense of respect within the communities and that can sort of handle cultural insecurity? Yeah. Uh, Thomas Sefcik, um, you mentioned, um, it's actually a question for both uh, Pranab and, and uh, uh, Martin, and you mentioned kind of this ideal coalition. On the other side, you also said that it was interesting that, you know, the, the, the let's say, the disenchanted workers uh, um, uh, inequality created kind of went right and not left. Now, what do you make uh, of these recent developments in certain countries trying to combine kind of the left and right elements? You know, U.S. Uh, right thinkers, I don't know, uh, Oren Kass, you know, why capitalism is wrong for Main Street, Germany, you know, uh, Wagenknecht and others trying to create a new party, combining kind of right nationalism with left, uh, you know, economic policies. I'm Swiss. In Switzerland, we have in many referendums now a strange majority of, of, of right nationalistic and left green uh, against development, growth, uh, you know, uh, global capitalism. Denmark's uh, social democrats were trying to, you know, Mette Frederiksen, who is massive anti-immigration, you know, saying this is actually the right, the, the left, the left strategy. Um, France, where Le Pen is trying to incorporate certain left uh, economic elements. So is this, does it have merit? Do you see a, a, an option there? Um, just comment. Light there, but not. It's working. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Um, left has always been more factionalized. Always, not just recently. So this is not nothing new. Uh, you know, most countries you will see the number of, particularly when communists were there, there will be all kinds of factions in the communist parties. In general, it's because <laughs> I. I don't know why th that happens, but that certainly is important in terms of the, because the, the, the theoretical issues become too refined. So I don't follow your left theory, so I provide my left theory and so on. So I would say the current crisis that we are discussing, left factionalism uh, by itself is not that important. Uh, in fact, in many countries, the, the left is essentially becoming irrelevant because they are not addressing some of the, certainly not the cultural narrative that I was talking about, but also some of the uh, other issues that, that have come up in our uh, discussion. On the shame issue, I'm not sure exactly what you have in mind. I find sometimes very interesting, um, uh, something different from shame. So let me give you an example, not from India, but from uh, United States South. I don't know how many of you have seen this book by a sociologist who happens to be my Berkeley colleague, uh, Arlie Hochschild, has a book called Strangers in Their Own Land. She went and surveyed and lived with them uh, for in Louisiana and tried to understand the anger of these workers. And they are telling them, we, they are angry with the liberals. Why? Because the liberals appease the minorities and the immigrants. In India, you see the same thing. Anger, the Hindu anger against the liberals because the liberals appease Muslims. Very similar to what Ali Yorkshire. But then Ali, since she's from Berkeley, she had to mention this. She said, look, but yes, oh, yeah, and, and, and this, why are these um, um, minorities and immigrants so bad? The answer is, quite often the answer is, they're 
cutting the line. In other words, they're getting priority in benefits. So early then pointed out to, by the way, this whole area is chemically polluted by these big oil companies. There's a lot of cancer around. Aren't you worked up? Aren't you, aren't you angry about that? No, they have, they, their anger is posed to the minorities and the... So here, you should be, you know, the, is this... I'm focusing on the anger against the liberals. I don't think it has anything to do with the shame. What shame sometimes does is... Um, I've seen this in some religious co religious context, and probably that's what you had in mind. But in a sense, if and this is often sometimes generational, the young people are not keeping the faith, as it were, in its pure form. So the others become ashamed that we are losing cultural mores that we are. We are anchored in, and that brings shame. And and this also not just to old people. Some of the young sometimes adopt this. There are slogans that uh, Modi uses, uh, Modi's party uses. Is you don't have, should not have any shame to say that you are a proud Hindu. So you try to overcome any other tensions by saying, I'm a proud Hindu. These are the foot soldiers of essentially a kind of uh, uh, reactionary right-wing movement. Um, so that is the use of shame that I have sometimes seen. Otherwise, I don't really have much of an answer to that. On the issue of the left-right um, thing that you mentioned, in a sense, I, I, I talked about some of the left, some of the right-wing have taken up uh, the, the left issues have taken up the wind out of the sail of those. And in a sense, uh, the, the, it's, it is, it probably, uh, in a sense, uh, illustrates the point that I made originally that you cannot just think in economic terms. So why is it that Denmark, Sweden, cases that kind of that you mentioned, where, compared to the United States, economic security is largely taken care of, even though austerity policies had some impact, even in Sweden, even in uh, some of those Scandinavian countries. But relative to the US, they're more economically secure. And therefore, the cultural insecurity becomes more prominent, relatively speaking. And that's why they're focused on immigration. And to me, and that's the point that I was trying to make before, that we cannot just think it's the financial crisis or the economic issue. Yes, it came after the financial crisis, but in more secure countries, the focus on those, and in Denmark, in and Sweden, the mainstream parties are internalizing those issues. So the Denmark, Netherlands, they have adopted the anti-migration thing, even in the so-called left parties, I mean, the social democratic parties. They're taking the agenda. And so the, what I talked about, the wind out of the sail of the left. So the left are now trying to take the wind out of the sail from the right. But you don't see a big potential coalition party. I don't. Well, <laughs> there used to be the case in Germany. They used to say the social democrats and the Christian democrats are together. But that, of course, broke down. Uh, and now the social, social democrats and greens are, are together. But I'm not sure how the coalition is going what we have to uh, anybody have an urgent question, a really pressing question? Yeah, okay, we'll take one, uh, two, we'll take one and two. Yes. Professor Vardhan, my name is Bashup. I actually have a contrarian view to, I've not read your book to your thesis, so in this sense, this is the debate question, which hopefully you will take in the spirit of the great Democrat that you are. So you lamented the demise of trade unions. I happened to come from the state of West Bengal in India, where as I grew up, I knew extreme leftism and trade unionism decimated the economic climate of that state, resulting in several of us, of our generation, needing to move out of that state to find employment in the rest of India and abroad. And to, even today, West Bengal is probably one of the lowest in terms of economic indicators compared to the rest of India. Uh, 
And my second question is, uh, in terms of also the impact of capitalism and big capital, if we look at, forget all the technology and the medical innovation and everything that has happened, if we just look at it pure from a poverty alleviation issue, if we think of China post-1989 and India post-1992, I think close to 500 to 550 million on conservative estimate of human beings have been pulled out of real poverty following the embracing of free market capitalism. So despite all its contradictions, can it, you know, can it still be denied that capitalism still remains the really the driving force okay. of proper uh, economic second progress? Question. Sorry, just AI. before coming to West Bengal, I personally don't believe that, uh, and here probably Martin and Tim may disagree with me, the large rise in, uh, uh, the, the large um, improvement, maybe half a billion people, more than half a billion people in China and India together, brought out above the poverty line, it's all due to free market capitalism. I don't believe that. And in fact, I discussed this in the, in the, uh, in my, I have a book on China, India book. I discussed that. In fact, I show with data, like the Chinese case, where the reduction of poverty was phenomenal. The, the, China went into globalization in a big way by end 1990, okay? The reduction, most of the reduction of poverty happened before that. Hundreds of millions of people improved in the 1980s because of agricultural reform. With the uh, decline of the comm communes, uh, individual responsibility system, irrigation improvement. So I show that this myth that the Chinese phenomenal and improvement in poverty is all due to globalization, all due to free market capitalism, I don't believe that. Yes, they played a role, later labor market, labor intensive industrialization, uh, brought about quite a bit of improvement uh, in the poverty, but numerically the largest improvement was in the agricultural sector, not in the global health sector. I do not deny that free market capitalism has a positive role, particularly I talked about innovations, etc. But Chinese case and the Indian case, Indian case, the, the, the liberalization happened even later than China. The, more people went out of poverty because of green revolution than because of expansion of trade. In okay, any case, so, so what yeah. about AI? Yeah, um, okay. No, I thought... Uh, just one minute. Yeah, yeah, okay, one minute. AI, in a sense, uh, is re-emphasizes something that I mentioned before. I think labor has to have a voice in corporate governance because they decide what the R&D in AI would be for, for, for the next 20 years. And this is what a point that Darren Asimoglu is making uh, quite a bit on AI, that we can turn, use AI in labor empowering direction, lab, job creating direction, than labor replacing direction. It's not easy, but at the moment, it's, a, it's all in the other direction. I think the voice of labor can play some role. Okay, great. Well, um, we've covered an enormous range, and it has been uh, illuminating, education, educational, and also um, provocative with uh, many points of disagreement. So thank you very much. And remember, there will now be um, a book signing, book selling, buying, 
uh, opportunity outside this theater, just outside.